I'm Lucy Watts MBE, I'm 23 years old and I have a number of complex and life limiting conditions. I live at home with my mum, Kate, my elder sister Vicky and my assistant's dog Molly. My conditions are very complex. They mean I'm hooked up to intravenous drips at least 21 hours a day, I'm completely dependent on a wheelchair, forced to spend a lot of time in bed, dependent on intravenous nutrition and medications, a ventigastrostomy and an ileostomy and urostomy. My conditions are life limiting. I shouldn't have made it to the age of 23, but I squeeze out of life all that I can. Today, I want to share our story. Our story echoes the stories of many carers across the country, except in a cruel twist of fate, my mum, my carer, became unwell. I was born with health problems, but these went undiagnosed through my childhood, despite seeing many doctors. I struggled with symptoms including pain and progressive muscle weakness, but I got on with life as best I could. In January 2008, at the age of 14, my life came to a halt. I stopped being able to walk, to go to school, to horse ride and walk the dogs. I became dependent upon a wheelchair and needed help with everything. I could no longer go to school, so I needed to continue my education at home and we had to fight to get this. This was the first of many, many battles. Not only had my life come to a standstill, but my dad had walked out, so my mum was now a single parent. You'd think when I became ill that I would automatically get the health care I needed, but we had to fight for that as well. And even when I did get a diagnosis of my condition in October 2008 at the age of 15, which we thought would make a big difference, it didn't. I was still accused of being lazy and my mum accused of just allowing me to be sick. In March 2009, I stopped being able to eat. My gut couldn't tolerate, digest or absorb food properly. After losing six stone in six months and fighting again and again for support, as well as nearly suffering organ failure, I was eventually started on tube feeding by a nasogastric tube. My mum was taught how to undertake these feeds and I went home. However, for the first 20 months of my illness, mum had cared for me single-handedly, so she had no support whatsoever for the first 20 months of my illness. Now I was dependent on tube feeding, however, she couldn't leave me. I couldn't be left at home during the day on my own. So we had the first battle for a care package. Fortunately, we won that battle and I had a carer come in while mum was at work. This meant I could have my personal care needs met, the feed could be administered and mum could safely leave me at home in the knowledge I'd be cared for. But sadly, this care only lasted while my mum was at work. So the minute mum came home from work, she was then caring for me full time with no help during the evenings or at weekends. My condition, sadly, continued to deteriorate. My paediatrician, on the week of my 16th birthday, announced he was discharging me, with no adult team to take over. Mum and I were once again, on our own, fighting the system to get an adult team together, which we fortunately, fortunately secured over 2010. In 2011, I nearly died from malnutrition. My body wasn't digesting or absorbing the nutritional feeds into my stomach or small bowel. I was starving to death, I'd had a heart attack, my bone marrow was failing, I had no fat or muscle and I was dying. We couldn't get to see my London consultants because the wait to see them was too long. Eventually we came across the Jays Hospice, a young adult hospice at home service based in Essex where we live. We contacted them and Bev, the lead nurse, came out to visit us. Bev, the nurse, was horrified at what she saw a skeletal 17 year old who was going to die if something didn't happen. She phoned my consultants immediately after leaving us and got me admitted to hospital as if I didn't get admitted I would have died. There, once admitted, I was started on total parenteral nutrition or TPN which is feeding directly into the bloodstream. Little did I know that when I was admitted my mum had been taken aside by the nutrition consultant who had told her he thought I'd been, been left too late and that I wouldn't survive. Fortunately, I did survive, my body did tolerate the nutrition and we started making the preparations to come home. However, in order for me to come home, my mum needed to learn the specialist medical techniques necessary to look after my line, administer the TPN and medications. 
I couldn't come home until a package had been sorted to train my mum in order to do this. I spent six weeks in hospital and finally we were allowed to come home. We had a nurse come in morning and evening to train my mum on how to administer the TPM and care for my line. After a week, mum was signed off and she was left alone to do it. My sister worked full time, my dad wasn't on the scene, so if mum didn't do it, I wouldn't survive. So we carried on as we were. I had carers coming in whilst mum was at work, but they couldn't give her a full break because they can't administer the TPM or medications. This meant mum was working full time and in effect caring full time as well. She would be getting up early in the morning, getting herself ready for work, administering intravenous medications and feed, going to work, coming home at lunchtime, administering more medication, going back to work and coming home for an evening and then spending from four o'clock in the afternoon until 11 o'clock at night administering intravenous medications. At night, she didn't even get a break. She would drag her mattress onto the floor of my bedroom and sleep next to me. She never got a break, not one day off. In 2012, I had an ileostomy formed, which is a stoma bag. This just added to my mum's care load. She was not only administering TPN and medications and caring for a Hickman line, as well as a venting gastrostomy, but she was now also caring for a stoma bag as well. However, mum was struggling. She was reaching breaking point. She'd not had a day off in six years and she was truly exhausted. She couldn't continue working full time and caring full time. The carers were effectively useless as mum could not leave me for more than a couple of hours between IV medications. We were struggling and we couldn't continue as we were. We turned to the CCG to battle for a care package in which my mum could get paid under the exceptional circumstance clause. Had I had it for religious reasons or because I couldn't speak English, I would have automatically got the payment for mum on my package. But unfortunately, they didn't consider us an exceptional circumstance and we had to fight long and hard to get that. We did win that battle and mum got paid to look after me at home although she only got paid three hours for one of the medications despite she was giving these medications round the clock and caring 24-7. They didn't take into account all the care she was doing, just one medication was all they would pay for. Mum giving up work meant not only were admissions and appointments not a problem but I could also attend events. Mum was exhausted but we managed. We tried to fight for some nursing care to give mum a break as nurses are the only ones that could administer my intravenous medications and feed but we were refused so we just carried on as we were despite the fact that mum was struggling and there was no backup plan and then the worst happened. Whilst out walking Molly one day my mum went blind. She managed to get herself home and by the time she got home her sight had returned. She kept this a secret from us but after a few days she finally told us what happened and went to the GP. He referred her on to the stroke clinic and they did a brain scan which discovered a fairly large brain tumour. Our world collapsed. She soon saw a neurosurgeon who booked her in for surgery three weeks later. But what was going to happen to me? I didn't have a suitable care package. In those three weeks we fought tooth and nail for a care package. We were repeatedly told that I would be placed in an elderly care home. Not only would I be in a care home, but I would not be allowed to visit my mum. I would not be allowed to see Molly. I would not be allowed to do my charity work. I would never be able to go out and I wouldn't even be allowed to attend my hospital appointments. We refused repeatedly, but they kept insisting. In the end, we had to threaten a legal case and go into the press for them to give me a proper care package. How is that right? Why should we have had to threaten them in order to get a care package that allowed a 21 year old to stay at home? Fortunately, we managed to secure a package. I have an intensive care nurse with me from 7 o'clock in the morning till 11 o'clock at night. I then have a carer from 10.30 at night until 7.30 in the morning. This package was agreed for six weeks. Just six weeks after major brain surgery, my mum was expected to go back to caring 24-7 without support. But at least we had the package and at least mum could have her surgery. The package started the day of mum's operation. Neither mum nor I had any chance for a handover or for me to get used to the staff. 
Mum went off to hospital and I was dependent on complete strangers, but I managed. At least I was able to stay at home. However, worse was yet to come. Mum's operation itself was a success. They removed the tumour and everything seemed to have gone well. Mum then became poorly in recovery and they rushed her back to theatre as she'd had a bleed on the brain. They removed the blood, closed her back up again and brought her back to recovery where, unfortunately, Mum later suffered a stroke. My world caved in. All the surgeon could say was that he'd seen people survive worse and people die from less. They didn't know if Mum was going to survive the night. I was facing my worst nightmare, the fear of losing my mum. I visited Mum that night in the hospital. She wasn't even aware I was there, let alone who I was. She was in the bed, a shell, a body, not a person. Seeing my mum like that was one of the worst things I'd ever experienced. Fortunately, after about three weeks, mum regained her awareness. She had intensive speech therapy and intensive physiotherapy and came home six weeks after her surgery. Mum has done amazingly, but she has lasting problems. Mum's complications meant that my care package, that had only been agreed for six weeks, had to be indefinitely extended. Mum was making a good recovery. Her surgery was in May 2015 and things seemed to be going well. Then, in February 2016, out of the blue, my mum suffered a 15 minute seizure. I thought I was losing my mum all over again. Sadly, mum suffered two further seizures and got a diagnosis of epilepsy. She's on anti-epileptic medication and will be for the rest of her life. However, we get on with life as best we can. Unfortunately, in 2016, my health deteriorated. My visions of far exceeding the five-year prognosis I was given in 2012 were seeming unlikely. I was now unable to wait there to transfer, an ability I had fought to retain for nine years. Unfortunately, this meant that the care package I had was inadequate, as one nurse on their own cannot hoist me, and I now am completely dependent on a hoist. This means mum has been forced to step in and care for me once again, despite everything she's been through. She provides at least six hours care a day, two to one care, to wash me, to dress me, to hoist me and take me out. If mum does not do this, I will not be able to get washed, dressed or go out. The CCG are relying on my mum to do this for free, once again. They promised me, after assessing me in January, that my mum would get paid to provide the two to one care, but this has not yet happened. She's just expected, as usual, to get on with it without any recognition and without any support. What frightens me at the moment is if mum were to get ill, there'd be no second person to provide my care. That could mean going weeks without a wash, without changing my clothes or changing my bed, let alone being hoisted and going out. How is that safe and how is that hygienic? My mum shouldn't be working seven days a week, caring for me at least six hours a day, for free without support. So that's our story. I want to reiterate some key points at the end of this video that I want people to take away with them. My mum, for the nine and a half years I've been ill, has been relied on too heavily to provide my care. She's not been recognised or appreciated for all that she's done. Do you feel underappreciated as a carer? I do. I, do. I really, really do. Because not for financial reward we're not doing it for that but it we do it out of love but it should be recognized that we do provide vital care for well our children our partners whoever we're caring for my mum has not been valued or appreciated for the millions of pounds she saved the ccg in care fees over the time she cared for me she's not been appreciated for all the sacrifices she's made for all the things she's done, the hours she's, she's spent caring for me, she's not been appreciated or valued in the slightest. Do you feel unpaid carers are valued or appreciated enough? No, definitely not. We do so much behind the scenes and it shouldn't just be expected, we should be recognised for it. Not only my mum as a carer getting support, but me as a 23 year old young adult I should have the support I need too. I want to live my life, make the most of what time I've got left, spend quality time with my family. I should have the support I deserve too. Do you feel the system has let Lucy down? 
dreadfully. I really do. It's so hard stepping back as a parent and watching your daughter fight for absolutely everything that she is entitled to. In 2015, when my mum got diagnosed and we turned to them for support, they told me I would have to go into a care home. How can you say that a 21-year-old isn't in a good place in an old people's home? Can you imagine how my mum must have felt thinking and feeling so guilty that she had a brain tumour and she was going into hospital and I couldn't get the care I needed? It must have been awful. Tell us about the battle for a care package. It was awful. It was really hard. And we only had three weeks to do it because I had to go in and have the brain tumour removed. Um, and I was, I was, I wanted to keep Lucy at home. There was no way I wanted her to go into a care home or anything like that. So, but the CCG um, weren't very supportive initially, but we did manage to get the package that Lucy needed to keep her at home. This is our story, one of millions of stories like this. What people forget is that anyone has the potential to become a carer. And anyone is only an accident or an illness away from needing care themselves. It's time carers were valued and recognised by the government for the billions they save every year and the millions of hours of care they provide, unpaid, unappreciated, unvalued. It's time to care about the carers.